Now we will watch a film. First, with a speech from Dr. Thomas Kingsley Brown, and then a conversation between uh, Dr. Brown and Andreas Wall Blomqvist. Dr. Thomas Brown has been researching, writing, and speaking about ibogaine treatment for substance dependence since 2009. His academic training is in chemistry and anthropology. Andreas Wall Blomqvist is a medical doctor, researcher, and author of the recently published book Ulovli Medicine, Illicit Medicine. He is a head of ASDP's scientific advisory committee and a board member of the Norwegian Association for Psychedelic Science. So now we will watch a movie together. Yeah. Hello from my son's bedroom here in San Diego, California. I'm Thomas Brown, and I'm speaking with you about treating addiction with ibogaine. Uh, I'm an anthropologist, and I've been studying addiction treatment with ibogaine for about 12 years now. Uh, and as I'll mention shortly, I conducted a research study in Mexico with people who were seeking ibogaine treatment for their addiction to opioids. So first of all, uh, let's look and see what ibogaine is. Ibogaine is a chemical compound that is uh, found in the root bark of a shrub called iboga. And the iboga is something that grows in West Central Africa. And it is something that is used as a sacrament in rituals in West Central Africa, but primarily in Gabon. And in these initiatory rituals, uh, the participants will typically uh, travel to the land of the dead. They may interact with or have conversations with ancestral, ancestral spirits, and they will become initiates and they will become reborn as initiates in the Bwiti tradition. And uh, so you may be wondering, why would something like this be used to treat addiction? And the short answer is that this gentleman here, uh, Howard Lotsoff, when he was just 19 years old, uh, 1962, in Brooklyn, New York City, uh, he uh, managed to find some ibogaine. And um, he, at the time, he was a daily user of heroin. He was addicted to heroin. And he found some ibogaine and was told by the person who gave it to him to expect a very long uh, hallucinogenic journey lasting, say, 36 hours or so. And uh, so Howard Lotsoff took this ibogaine one day, having no idea what to expect other than this long hallucinogenic journey, which he did have. And uh, it was a quite exhausting experience for him. And at the end of this experience, he thought he would never do or use ibogaine again because it was such a difficult experience for him. But he went to sleep and woke up about three hours later, completely refreshed. and realized very shortly thereafter that he was not in an heroin withdrawal, even though he hadn't had any for more than 36 hours. He is not craving heroin. In fact, his relationship to heroin, he realized, had completely changed, where prior to this, he viewed heroin as something that gave him comfort. He now viewed heroin as something that emulated death. And he said to himself, I prefer life to death. And eventually he, he made it his life's mission to bring Ibogaine treatment for addiction to the world. One big problem though soon came up, that is in the late 60s, uh, as part of the US war on drugs, Ibogaine along with uh, LSD and psilocybin and many other psychoactive compounds that were associated with the kind of 1960s hippies uh, counterculture were made illegal. And uh, Ibogaine was also put on schedule one in the US and that's the most restrictive schedule, which by definition means that the substance is uh, highly prone to abuse and it has no medical value. And in my opinion, Ibogaine is in fact the opposite of those things. It 
It is exactly, it is not at all addictive. In fact, it is used to treat addiction and it therefore has medical value. So Lotsoff in the 80s began this campaign to bring Ibogaine treatment to the world. One of the things he did was to apply for and receive five patents from the US uh, for rapid methods for interrupting addiction syndromes. The first one was this one pictured here, which was for narcotic addiction. He also then went on to get patents for uh, nicotine and tobacco addiction, uh, cocaine and amphetamine addiction, alcohol addiction, and also polydrug addiction. And these were patents for the uh, interruption of, uh, of addiction. And so he viewed began as an addiction interrupter. And with a single treatment, he was saying that these, that it could interrupt addiction to these different substances. Uh, he also reached out in the late 80s, mid 80s, uh, in late 80s, reached out to several scientists uh, who were initially very skeptical, including this man who was skeptical initially, Dr. Stanley Glick, who, uh, along with other scientists, initiated some research using animals to see if ibogaine was effective. And they found out that it was very effective in reducing withdrawal-like symptoms uh, on the part of these animals, uh, mice, rats, and some, some other species, and also in reducing drug self-administration by these species. Uh, Glick and other scientists were so impressed, indeed, with the, uh, with the efficacy of ibogaine in the animal model that they have uh, produced chemical analogs, synthetic analogs to Ibogaine. Uh, Stanley Glick is famous for having uh, invented something called 18MC, 18-methoxychloronaridine, uh, as well as some other related compounds. And you see some, uh, pictures of them here. Uh, there is Ibogaine and some related uh, uh, compounds, analogs. And there are many others that have been created. And uh, currently, um, uh, 18MC and other analogs are, are being studied and are being considered as drugs to bring to market in the US and other countries. Uh, so clearly these uh, individuals who are creating these compounds and testing them believe in the efficacy of Ibogaine, but their aim is to create something that is as effective as Ibogaine without the so-called side effects. And those include the psychoactive effects. Uh, Ibogaine produces a sort of dreamlike uh, state of consciousness. And it also has some, uh, some deleterious effects such as uh, body tremor, and it has some um, cardiotoxicity and, um, and it causes nausea and so on. So the aim is to produce these compounds that are effective, but don't have those side effects primarily the psychoactivity, which is the reason why uh, Ibogaine was placed on schedule one and was made illegal. That is, it was psychoactive and was made illegal because of that. So another thing that Lotsoff did at the time in the late 1980s was to uh, start with a small group of people uh, treating people in uh, the Netherlands where Ibogaine was not criminalized, was not regulated in any way. And um, you see him here in front of an apartment building where some of these early treatments took place in, in Rotterdam. Uh, and uh, these other also treatment took, treatments took place in places like hotel rooms here, pictured here, this one in Amsterdam and other places in New York City where Ibogaine had become illegal. Uh, these treatments were also being done underground. And the advocates for these treatments were, were people who are addicted to heroin, uh, including this gentleman here, Nico Adrians, who founded the Junkie Bond in, uh, in the Netherlands in the late uh, 80s. And we also had uh, Bob Sisko, uh, who uh, founded something called the International Coalition of Addicts Self-Help. So these were these so-called addicts self-help groups uh, who were advocating for Ibogaine treatment and so they also believed in the efficacy of Ibogaine. And they started these treatments on a very small scale. They also went and spoke at conferences like this one in, uh, in Rotterdam in 1992, uh, Harm Reduction Forum. They also uh, went to rallies and, and held rallies and uh, advocating for uh, research testing of Ibogaine and making Ibogaine available as a possible treatment for addiction. 
So there was all this activity and yet uh, very little uh, response on the part of government, governmental agencies. And so there was no research or very little research for many, for, for decades on Ibogaine uh, until more recently. But these, these treatments that were begun in New York City and in the Netherlands started on a very small scale, but soon by the early 2000s, there, the treat, number of treatments per year was growing rapidly. Uh, you see here that in early 2001, um, there were nearly 900 treatments that had been performed outside of Africa. And just five years later, that number had roughly quadrupled to about 3,500. And uh, the authors of this paper, Ken Alper, Howard Lotsoff, and Charles Kaplan, uh, state that the growth rate of the number of treatments was about 30% per year. So it was growing very rapidly. Uh, and you see here, this is a map that was uh, drawn from the studies, uh, th that very same study, the treatment sites that existed in February 2006. Uh, there were 13 of them. And you can see that these are scattered about often in Europe and uh, North America and Central America. And the, the commonality here is that these are countries where um, where Ibogaine was not regulated, was not criminalized. And so this is where the treatment sites popped up. There were also treatments being done underground in countries where Ibogaine was illegal, including the US. And uh, so these treatments continued. And fast forward to, 14, or to 2014, just eight years later, uh, the number of treatment sites had roughly tripled. We had about 40 treatment sites, possibly more uh, in 2014, so the number had tripled in about eight years. And then just a few years later in 2017, we had about 70 treatment sites around the world. And uh, my estimation from having spoken to people who were following these things is that the number topped out at around 80 and is probably around that number right now in 2021. So this movement grew rapidly and uh, has, has uh, produced probably 15,000 or more treatments around the world since the late 1980s. So clearly a lot of people think that uh, that Ibogaine treatment is, is, is effective and they are seeking this treatment out um, despite some problems with it. And there are some attendant problems with this, uh, with this, with this movement and that is as Brian Vestag called it, a vast uncontrolled experiment where um, many people start providing treatments. They don't have any uh, medical training and uh, they uh, may not be following best known practices that were developed over years of, uh, of trial and error. And uh, there's no oversight for the treatment practice because these, these things are being done in countries where Ibogaine is not regulated or criminalized. And, there is no certification of treatment providers. Uh, patients generally have to travel abroad for treatment if they can afford to do that. Um, so, uh, and there's also a difficulty in discerning which treatment sites are utilizing best practices or using uh, the most effective uh, uh, treatments and uh, following good safety practices. So, uh, and also at this point, the evidence for the efficacy of Ibogaine was almost completely anecdotal because and we had thousands of people being treated, but, uh, but very little research being done to show that it was actually working. However, in, in recent years, there have been some outcome studies. Uh, one of those was a study that I conducted at uh, Ibogaine treatment sites in Baja, California, Mexico. And the other one was a study that was virtually the same uh, research protocol that was done by my colleague, Jeff Noller in New Zealand, where Ibogaine treatment is actually legal. Um, nowadays. So these studies, uh, we recruited people uh, who were seeking treatment for uh, addiction to opioids at these different clinics. And I want to summarize the outcomes. I encourage you to look at the, out the uh, articles that are available uh, for free online. Um, but our, our studies showed, um, and we had 30 participants in the Mexico study and 14 in New Zealand. Um, we showed that Ibogaine drastically and significantly reduced withdrawal symptoms for people with, uh, taking these treatments. And these are people who are heavy users of heroin, oxycodone, and other opioids, and often other, other drugs. And the ability of Ibogaine to reduce those withdrawal symptoms is on par with that of methadone, which is an opioid replacement treatment. 
So ibogaine, which does not replace methadone, does not replace the opioid at the receptor site, is on par with methadone. And it, this is a, with a single treatment. And it's not something that needs to be done daily uh, for years. Uh, secondly, ibogaine reduced drug use severity for 12 months. And this was our treatment, our follow-up period was 12 months. And we showed that the severity of drug use was reduced for 12 months for this, the, the study population. And what this means is that people were using the drug, the problematic drugs less frequently, they were using less of those drugs, and most importantly, their sense of how problematic their drug use was, was greatly reduced. That is, they were able to control their drug use in a way that they hadn't been able to before. Uh, also, we showed that the uh, depression rating scale scores were improved for people in the New Zealand study for 12 months. And in the pooled data, we showed that they were reduced for people at one month. Uh, and that means that uh, people are less depressed than they were uh, prior to treatment. And to my mind, uh, very importantly, in our study in Mexico, we showed that uh, for 12 months following treatment, uh, people had improved family and social status. This is one of the measures that we used with something called the addiction severity index. And what this really means in plain language is that following treatment, people said that their relationships with those who matter most in their lives, their family members and loved ones and people they work with were improved for 12 months following treatment. So to summarize, I wanna tell you what I, I have found from uh, my 12 years of study. These are the, I think, most important take-home messages. First of all, Ibogaine works. Uh, it is successful with only a single treatment for many people. In fact, well over 90% of the people who are treated are uh, able to reduce their withdrawal symptoms and they are able to uh, have a choice they, that means they basically have a freedom to choose whether to use those drugs because they're able to deal with those withdrawal symptoms and, and those cravings. And uh, so it gives them this window of opportunity. And also oftentimes gives people insight into the nature of their addiction, the possibly the root traumas that are, uh, that are causing their addictive behaviors and they're trapping them in these, in these behavioral patterns that are harmful. So uh, also uh, I've, I've come to see that ibogaine treatment can be done safely with proper screening and under, under the right conditions. In this wild west atmosphere that uh, the ibogaine treatment community has grown up, uh, it has produced these problems where uh, because people aren't careful in their treatment protocols, sometimes people are, are harmed. There have been deaths related to ibogaine treatment. And I, I must point out that the known number of, of deaths related to ibogaine treatment is far fewer than 100. And here in the US alone, there are 135 people a day uh, dying from opioid overdose. So ibogaine treatment can be done safely. And even under current circumstances where these things are, uh, where it's hard to find a clinic where the proper safety protocols are being followed, the proper screening is being followed, um, People who are addicted and who, who have lost hope that they can recover are willing to take the risk of ibogaine treatment because the ad addictions that they face are far riskier and are far more harmful. Um, and also, finally, the, the main problem with ibogaine treatment, uh, these problems are caused by the fact that ibogaine is illegal in many countries and um, is unregulated in most places where the treatments are done because of this that leads to a situation in which there is no standardization of treatment there is no uh, way for, to know if people are following best known practices and safety protocols so i began works and it can be done safely and i my opinion is that if governments are involved in providing the opportunity for people to use i began safely and under controlled conditions this can be a very beneficial treatment and can be something that can be very helpful in addressing the opioid overdose crisis. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Thomas, for your presentation and your research into ibogaine therapy. 
And given that there are now small uh, observational studies showing the benefit of ibogaine therapy, as well as numerous clinics that offer this treatment, why don't you think we have more studies using ibogaine? Well, it's very difficult to, uh, to get approval for studying ibogaine uh, in most countries, including the US um, here where ibogaine is a schedule one substance, which is the most restrictive schedule. So uh, getting permission to do research is, is very difficult. And in my opinion, the, the main reason why it is on schedule one is because it's psychoactive and it was simply swept up in the, uh, the war on drugs back in the late 60s and uh, was made illegal and then it was, uh, it was put on schedule one. So because it's psychoactive and it was simply grouped along with these other psychoactive things like LSD and psilocybin and, uh, and made yeah, but, it very difficult uh, to work with. And the research on, on psychedelics are now sort of having a renaissance, but uh, why don't we see Ibogaine like joining? That's an interesting question. And um, I've, I've heard Ibogaine sort of referred to as the sort of the, 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 the lonely stepchild of the psychedelics world. Uh, it has gotten this reputation and part because of the, as, as I'm sure you're aware, there are uh, some risks associated with Ibogaine treatment. And many of those are, those risks are related to the fact that people were coming into treatment in very poor physical health. And they're, you know, usually with years of, of very uh, heavy uh, opioid use. And uh, there aren't any standardized practices at these, at these clinics. And so, uh, you know, but the fact is that there have been deaths documented, as my colleague uh, Ken Alper says, in close temporal proximity to ibogaine treatment, and um, you know, it's gotten this reputation as a dangerous sort of drug. Whereas the other psychedelics like uh, LSD and psilocybin do not have that reputation as being dangerous. Um, yeah. yeah, I understand. Well, uh, ibogaine has uh, a very complex pharmacology affecting many neurotransmitter systems at the same time. It is also has a unique psychoactive effect in that it seems to simulate or stimulate a sort of retrospective viewing of previous important or perhaps traumatic experiences. Can you tell us what you think is the important factor in how Ibogaine might help people with addiction? Uh, yes. Uh, so I referred to uh, other psychedelics like LSD and and psilocybin, uh, ibogaine is, is, you know, technically it's not one of those sort of classic hallucinogens or psychedelics, although it does give people insight into their, into their psyche and uh, into the, it goes, does give people psycho-spiritual insights. And, um, and it, but it, it's more properly called an oneric drug. That is, it's kind of a dream-like, dream-producing, um, uh, it produces that kind of state of consciousness like a waking dream. And um, as you mentioned, it has this, uh, this common feature, this typical feature where people have a kind of recall of past events in their lives. Sometimes they'll have uh, conversations with, uh, with people, uh, you know, whether they're famous figures or people from their families, they might relive conversations that have actually happened. They might even recall conversations that they had not even thought about since they were children, things like that. Um, and uh, my, my sense of how this works um, uh, psychologically, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a psychologist nor a psychiatrist, but uh, the insights that people get oftentimes have to do with things like they, they realize how much damage they've caused in their relationships and they have uh, very, very deep regrets uh, about the things that they've done and uh, and the things that they've done in the name of uh, acquiring uh, more of the substance that they're addicted to. Um, they also, uh, at the same time, can have this sort of uh, reconciliation and uh, understanding of where, maybe where their trauma that is coming from, what, what were the causes of their addiction and, and why they are in this cycle of behavior that is, that is harm, harmful for them. Uh, and, in some cases, you, you see people who um, are able to reconcile these traumatic events. Uh, I, I want to just give one example, and that is that 
um, there was a young man um, who was treated at, the, at one of the clinics in Baja, California, Mexico. Uh, he was, I think, 22 when I met him and he was receiving treatment, but he had um, been uh, in a very abusive family situation where his father, um, when, this, uh, when this young man was 15 years old, his father actually injected him with heroin. Uh, his mother left the family. Uh, his father was, was extreme, extremely abusive. And this young man ended up living on the streets in San Francisco for, for several years. Uh, and he said that when he went into treatment, he, he hated his father. He wasn't, and he wasn't in touch with his mother at all. He was estranged. And during the Ibogaine experience, uh, he had this insight, this revelation that, uh, you know, despite all the horrible things that his parents had done and, and that uh, he, his experiences really made him who he was. And he, he was able to forgive his parents uh, for, for everything. And the power of that, that, that he could reconcile that. And, and then he got in touch with his mother after that and they reestablished a relationship uh, that's a very powerful thing to be able to do to reestablish those kinds of relationships. And uh, they're, they're, it's, it's a transformational, truly transformational experience. Yeah, uh, really interesting. I also know that you did a, you and others, you did a study exploring the subjective experiences of 44 participants from these observational studies you, that you mentioned in your talk. Yes, yes. In this study, I, I know that you uh, you said you found that half of the subjects had some kind of complete mystical experience. You used uh, the states of question, the states or uh, states of consciousness questionnaire. And can you tell us more about this study and, and how important do you think the psychological experience is regarding the, the treatment effect? Yeah, um, so that study, yes, we took the, um, some of the data from both of the studies. There was the Mexico-based study that I mentioned in my presentation and the New Zealand-based study that my colleague uh, Jeff Noller uh, did. And we had 44 total people from the two studies and we'd, we'd asked them to write about their experiences uh, after their treatment. And we had also, as you mentioned, given them the States of Consciousness questionnaire. And so we had this, we had the, that measure showing that some of them had full on mystical experiences. And um, there was quite a variation, a variability in the intensity of the experiences that different people had. Um, but many of them had very profound experiences. And the, the narratives that we, had, we obtained from what the, these people wrote about their experiences and also from the interviews that we had with them over the 12 month period after their treatment. You know, sometimes they would tell us about other things that they hadn't told us about earlier. And um, we, we kept records of all these things. Um, and for the people who, were, were state, who, were, who stayed in the study and who actually followed through for those 12 months, the the a, a disproportionate number of those people had those very powerful experiences and my my sense is that uh the powerful experience gave them the sense that something had happened that something had worked with that and there are some people who had the ibogaine treatment who didn't have much of a, a psychological a psycho spiritual experience at all um who didn't remember anything from it it was kind of a jumble of confusing imagery that sort of thing. And uh, those people were much more likely to drop out of the study. Um, and individuals told me, you know, over and over again, that they found the experience that they had to be quite profound and transformational. So it wasn't just that they had these, you know, states of consciousness questionnaire scores that were high, they attributed a great deal to those experiences. So, um, uh, yeah, so that that helped. And like a correlation between like what type of experiences they had and the treatment effect. Um, we weren't able to demonstrate that in large in part because of the small number of people in the study and the small number of people who actually completed those kinds of questionnaires, the the narratives, um, and who continued to follow up through the study. Um, so. Uh, because of so many people dropped out of the study, what really stuck out to me when I looked at the data was that the people, as I mentioned, who stayed in the study were those who had the powerful experiences. And in our statistical analysis and in the original paper that Ken Alper and I did together, um, 
to have the greatest uh, statistical rigor, we assumed that anyone who dropped out of the study had reverted back to their baseline. That is, they were doing as badly as they did before treatment. So the treatment didn't work. So if you factor that in and you look at the, uh, you know, if you then look at the states of consciousness questionnaire results versus the, uh, the fact that people stayed in the study and you factor in that people who dropped out were doing badly, that actually shows that the people who had the intense experiences did better on follow-up for the 12 month period. So it's a little bit of sort of a, uh, almost like a shell game, but uh, that's, that's, it was so pronounced that uh, the people who stayed in the study were the ones who had those powerful experiences that uh, I think there's something to it. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's important to remember side effects when considering these types of therapies. And after interviewing so many subjects, do you think Ibocan can be psychologically harmful for some individuals? And if so, what type of individuals do you think is at risk for these harmful effects? Uh, well, not, from my interviews, I would say I haven't seen that it can be harmful. Um, and I haven't heard of people having... Uh, harmful experiences, with one exception, and it was somebody who used to work with MAPS, uh, who um, wasn't getting ibogaine for uh, for treatment of addiction, but was using it for psychospiritual purposes. And that person was left alone in a room uh, on a cold basement floor, and you know had a really just it, ibogaine can be a very very difficult experience, even if you're not recovering from from addiction. Uh, and if you're recovering from addiction, it can be very, very trying. So I would say that the, I, if someone is going in, I would say, you know, if you, if you are uh, experiencing, uh, if you're schizophrenic or experiencing um, uh, severe mental illness, they would, I would not advise going into Ibogaine treatment. Um, however, if you are otherwise, you know, mentally, you know, uh, and emotionally healthy, uh, then the, the only real risk is to not have any follow-up, to, to not have the kind of care. Um, I think that it's important to have at least someone in attendance while someone's doing Ibogaine. I certainly wouldn't re recommend that anybody take uh, Ibogaine or Iboga on their own and uh, just do it on their own. Um, but following up with people afterwards with good uh, psychotherapy and with, uh, you know, uh, uh, addiction recovery care uh, is very important to be able to, because people will have these difficult difficult experiences. They might feel tremendous remorse over things that they've done, uh, and um, feel like they've wasted their lives and things like that. And it's really important to have somebody to talk with about these experiences afterwards and be able to integrate those experiences and make something valuable out of them. All right. Uh, thank you so much for your time, Thomas. Do you have any closing remarks you want to say aloud to the conference? Uh, no, I don't think so. Just uh, to, to thank you, Andreas, for having me speak at the conference. And, um, and I regret that I could not be there in person. Yeah, likewise. Thank you. You're quite welcome.